Okay, let's talk through chapter seven, work, energy, and energy resources. So we'll talk about the definition of work, um, kinetic energy, and the relationship between work and energy, and then uh, what's called the work energy theorem. And we'll talk about gravitational potential energy, conservative energy, or conserving energy, or conservative forces. Um, and you can convert potential energy into kinetic energy and so on. Then we can talk about friction um, and other non-conservative forces and how that relates to the conservation of energy. And then we'll talk about power and then work and energy and power in uh, real life and then world energy use. Okay, so work and energy. So it goes through here, talks about um, just what energy is. It's a really important thing. Uh, we talk about it all the time. But what you really care about here is the scientific definition of work. And the scientific definition of work is um, when you have a force and you apply it over a certain distance. And um, if you have two force vectors here, um, we these are vectors. And this means the uh, magnitude of the vector. So it's the magnitude of the force times the magnitude of the displacement times the cosine of the angle between them. So if you apply a force over this distance and they're separated by an angle theta, you want F cosine theta, which is actually the component of the force along the displacement. So they're in the same direction. And that's what that cosine theta comes from. Okay, so um, we generally write it as FD cosine theta, where FD cosine theta is the uh, um, magnitude of the force times the magnitude of the distance and cosine is the angle cosine of the angle between them so the work here done by a guy pushing um a uh, uh a work apply work you do this force over this distance okay and let's say you pushed down on the lawnmower and moved the lawnmower that distance Okay, well, F cosine theta is this length. It's adjacent over hypotenuse. Okay, and that gives you the amount of F in the direction of the uh, push force. Okay, so you push F cosine theta over that distance. That's the amount of work done to push the lawnmower um, that distance. Okay, the importantly here, that cosine theta, this guy, he walks this distance and there's a normal force and there's a weight here, um, but in walking, there's no, there's no, this force, this normal force that he's applying to balance out the force of gravity, even though he's walking this way, he's not raising or lowering the briefcase. So the angle between the force here and the displacement is 90 degrees, so cosine of 90 is zero. And so that means he's doing no work um, raising or lowering that briefcase. Uh, he's not raising or lowering it because he's applying no force in the direction this way if he's walking at a constant speed. So that's the important thing is that your force has to be in the same direction as your displacement. Okay, um, if you take a briefcase up the stairs, however, now there's a component of this normal force that is you have to raise the briefcase up. You have to carry it up the stairs. This is why carrying things upstairs is heavier or harder than just walking them around uh, places. We just carry a TV straight across a room versus carrying it up the stairs, big difference, okay? And in this case, we've got a, um, you know, you're raising this thing, you're applying a force to raise it up a distance on an elevator or hooked to some sort of thing. And then again, it's force times distance. So if you apply a force, to an object and it moves a distance and there's an angle between them, it's F, D, and then the cosine of the angle between them. If your force is up and your force is that way, then, uh, you know, you get zero work done between those that force and that displacement. That force is not related to that displacement if they are 90 degrees apart from each other. That's how you can think about it. Okay, you got an example here. What's the work required to push a lawnmower? F, D, cosine, theta. Um, calculate that. 75 newtons, 25 meters is the distance, and the angle between is 35 degrees. That tells you how many joules. Okay, so that's energy. Work is joules. It's a unit of energy. And joule is similar to calorie. It's the same idea. Um, there's a relationship. One 
uh, kilocalorie is 4,186 joules of energy. Okay. Um, and I think the question here is, uh, convert the amount of work from joules to kilocalories and compare it to what your average intake of food is, um, 2,400 kilocalories per day. And, uh, you do that and it was about what, 0.367, uh, kilocalories to mow that lawn or well, at least to push it for 25 meters on level ground. Okay. Kinetic energy, um, the work energy theorem. So if you apply a force times a distance, you're going to do work. Okay. And so they're trying to, you know, anytime you have two numbers multiplying each other, you can think of it as an area like length times width gives you area. In this case, we have force times distance gives you an area. That area is called your work. And the work, um, is the amount of energy that you can, uh, that you basically take out or put into a, a system. Um, now, if you replace F with MA, you get MA times the distance, okay? And then you can solve for your um, acceleration from there. You can, uh, let's say, put all these back together and you get these new equation. You've seen this one before, um, kinematics equations. So work is turns out to be the same as the change in kinetic energy. Let's say you sped up or slowed down. Um, that's your that's your work energy theorem. Is basically you did net work. How much net work did you did? Well, if you sped up or you slowed down, then you had to change your kinetic energy. And that form of the uh, the equation for the for kinetic energy is one half mv squared. Um, this is called the kinetic energy. Anything that's moving has energy. And the amount of energy it has depends on its mass and how fast it's moving. It's just one half mv squared. Okay, so um, there's an example here. Suppose you got a 30 kilogram package uh, moving at 0.5 meters per second. What's the kinetic energy? One half mv squared. It's a one half times 30 kilogram package times 0.5 meters per second squared it gives you 3.75 joules. Okay, and that tells you uh, everything you need to know about that. So that's your uh, energy. Um, yeah, and then just a couple more examples. So now you've got kinetic energy is one concept of your uh, energy. And then gravitational potential energy is when you raise or lower something in a height. You raise it up, you bring it down, you're moving it up or down in gravity. Uh, in order to lift something up, you have to do work against mgh. So um, the force of gravity is mg. The displacement d is usually the height. So then the potential energy has the form mgh. So we have two forms now for kinetic energy, one half mv squared, and potential energy mgh. Those are our two forms of energy. Okay, and we can convert between them. We can go from potential energy to kinetic and vice versa. Um, we got a cuckoo clock here or something. Um, if you raise this acorn up a certain uh, distance d, then you do a certain amount of work, mgh. The energy in is mgh. If you drop that, um, by the time it got back to the bottom, so it starts with mgh, it's going to convert all that energy into kinetic energy, and it's going to end up being one-half mv squared. Uh, okay, and then, so we call this the change in potential energy if you raise something, mgh. Okay, and uh, using potential energy to simplify the calculations, um, you know, you go up and down these stairs and do all this stuff. Well, how much energy did you did? Uh, did you use up? It's just mgh. Okay? It doesn't matter. It's regardless of the path you took to get up there, the only thing that matters is how high did you go. And that's the work that you did, mgh. All right, so we got an example here. A 60 kilogram person jumps onto the floor from a height of three meters. So boom. Um, if you land stiffly, uh, calculate the force on the knee joints. Okay, so you got um, 60 kilograms three meters. So the uh, 60 kilogram person um, is just going to be, you're going to, you know, he's jumping off this thing. He's going to have MGH. All that MGH is going to can be converted into uh, kinetic energy right before it hits the ground. Okay. The work done on that person then when they jump down is MG times the distance. And then you're going to convert that into kinetic energy, which will be one half MV squared will equal MGH. And you can solve for uh, the uh, force then required. That's the question is calculate the force on the knee joints. The force is just mgh divided by that d, um, the force 
and the knee joint separation, and you get this 330,000 newtons or whatever. Um, 300,000 newtons. Okay, um, now this is a really cool example. If you want to find the speed of a roller coaster, if a roller coaster starts with an initial velocity of zero, at any point along this trajectory, the energy, which was initially all in gravitational potential energy, at any other point, it's going to be some combination 1 F mv squared plus mgh, because unless it goes all the way down to the bottom, he's always going to have some mgh, 25, 20, okay? So um, you can solve these problems really easily. You don't need to know anything about the path, the trajectory. You just need to know how high is the roller coaster, and then that allows you to... Um, uh, calculate at any point the velocity. All that matters is h. Okay, and then we get an example there. All right, con conservative forces of potential energy. Um, the potential of energy of a spring. This is a, a main, another main form of energy, and it has the form one half k x squared, where k is the stiffness of the spring. It's a number that we tell you, and then x is how much it's compressed. So if x is zero, there's no energy in the spring. If x is a couple centimeters, the more you compress the spring, the more energy is stored into it. The more you stretch the spring, the more the energy is stored in it. So you can have plus x or minus x. When you square it, you get the same amount of energy because you don't really care about whether it's plus or minus. It's the same amount of energy either way. Okay, so, um, so let's say you've got the spring and at the natural distance, x equals zero, nothing happens. You stretch it, delta x. So now you've stored in one half kx squared amount of energy into your uh, spring, and um, it stretches that thing out. Okay. Um, if you stretch this spring out and you get this amount of energy into it and you let it go, then when that little green marble goes back to the center, all of that energy is going to be converted into one half mv squared. So that's pretty nice. And then you can calculate how fast it's going to be traveling at that point. It's all conserved along that point. Um, so we've got a toy car, we've got a spring, we've got it going down a couple of paths and it ends up at this height h, all these things. So you start by writing the total kinetic, the total initial energy has to be equal to the total final energy. So you start with some initial velocity at some initial height in the gravitational potential with some initial compression of the spring and then you have after the, the spring is launched or the car is launched, you've got some final velocity for the car, some height, and some uh, energy still stored in the spring. If the spring is unloaded, then this is zero at the end. If your initial velocity is zero at the beginning, then that's zero. So you can figure out um, what your final velocity is given the fact. And if you start with, you know, so everything starts with your spring, and then afterwards it's split into... Um, kinetic energy and potential energy that you store into raising this thing up. So you write that down like that. Okay, and so then you solve for your final velocity um, that way. Okay, non-conservative forces. Friction is a non-conservative force. When you apply a force and you can't get it back, we call whatever's left the, non the work of a non-conservative force. So let's say you travel at force times the distance um, and the force is friction. So your work done is mu k or mu s times the normal force, um, and usually mu k times the normal force times the distance. That energy is lost. So if you have one half mv squared and then you experience some friction, you're going to have less than one half mv squared after the non-conservative force does work. Okay. So your total energy and your total final energy is going to differ by the work of a non-conservative force. You're going to start with more energy than you have at the end because the non-conservative force is going to carry it away. Okay, so here you have your non-conservative force times distance, whatever your initial velocity is. If something slowed you down to bring you to zero final energy, then you can solve for what the uh, distance that that force had to apply for over. And uh, that's the question here is uh, uh, calculate the distance the player slides if they skid. Okay, so the distance is uh, your kinetic energy divided by the force. Okay, which is pretty cool. Um, so there's more examples of that. And then your conservation of energy. All your energy has to be accounted for somewhere. 
your total initial, total final energy. Sometimes friction can carry it away, but you still have to start with that energy before you do it. So this is just accounting, um, keeping track of all your energy. Okay, so here's just the energy of various things, um, you know, whatever. Just to give you an idea here. Efficiency is defined as the energy uh, out out of the total energy. So, you know, if you eat a Dorito and you can only do one push-up, that's not very efficient. But if you eat one Dorito and you can do 10 push-ups, well, that's pretty good. You get a lot of energy out of your Dorito. Um, so the efficiency of doing certain things, uh, cycling and climbing is apparently pretty efficient, 20% efficiency. A human that swims, not very great. But if you swim underwater, a little bit better. So that's why you try to stay underwater as long as possible if you're a competitive swimmer. Um, shoveling, not great. Uh, steam engine, not great. Oops. Um, uh, diesel engine, nuclear power plant, coal power plant, electric motor, very efficient. Uh, compact fluorescent light, gas heater, uh, residential, and so on. 90% efficient. So that's pretty good. Um, so what is power then? So power is work that you do um, divided by time, the time that you take to do it. So if you expend a certain amount of energy, joules, in a certain amount of time, that's called your wattage. The quicker you expend energy, the higher your wattage. The slower you expend energy, the lower your wattage. Um, and that's pretty simple. So you calculate your work, you divide by the time. So um, there's an example of a power plant here. Um, these are wattages of different things. There's a crazy amount of wattage in a supernova when a star explodes at the end of its life. How do you like to explode when you die? Um, okay, power energy consumption. So the energy that you use is power times time, and that's usually kilowatt hours. So if you look at your energy bill, um, you'll see how many kilowatt hours you used, and that's how much energy you're using at a given time times the time that you did it for, okay? So you can calculate your energy cost. If you use 0.2 kilowatts of, of power and you did it for six hours um, per day for 30 days, you got 36 kilowatt hours. And if it tells you that it's 12 cents per kilowatt hour, then it costs you about four bucks a month to do that, okay? Um, so then your work energy and power in humans, you know, you eat something and then you do you do work, uh, which you lose. You got some thermal energy in your body. You store some energy in your fat, uh, all kinds of things like that. Um, there's just more biological examples of power and energy, why you need to eat. Wouldn't it be great if you didn't? Um, or at least you could do it whenever you wanted. And here's your energy consumption in watts. So sleeping obviously uses the least amount of energy, but sprinting, boy, that's a lot of energy. Okay, Shivering, a lot of energy. Um, playing basketball, a lot of energy. So, um, you know, that's a uh, pretty cool. Okay. World energy is so most of the world, uh, either burns oil or coal for energy, um, or natural gas. So your fossil fuels are, um, those, uh, those, uh, sources of energy. Um, but we've got a lot of nuclear. So France has some of the most nuclear power per capita. Uh, Japan has a lot too. And then you've got hydroelectricity, water, dams, and things like that. And then slowly but surely, uh, geothermal, wind, and everything else is going up. Uh, and other things are going down. Okay, um, and we're just going to keep needing more and more power as time goes on, as there's more and more people, and as we develop more and more cities. But we also get more and more efficient, so it's not an exponential rise. It's more of a linear rise. Okay, um, blah, blah, blah. And that's the end of that chapter. So um, in summary, work is force times distance, times the angle between the two vectors. Um, kinetic energy, the change in kinetic energy is equal to the network done on, a, on something. Gravitational potential has the form mgh. And so if you, ri if you raise any mass, a height h, you store energy into it, called gravitational potential energy. Um, if you have a conservative force, then the total energy before has to equal the total energy after. If you have a non-conservative force, then the total energy before has to equal more than your total energy after because you're going to lose some and you're not going to have as much at the end as you had at the beginning. Only the conservative parts of the forces will be on both sides of the equation. 
Um, so conservation of energy, all other forms are, are kept. So you can keep all those and calculate your total thing. And your efficiency here is just the work out divided by the energy in. And power is joules per second. So it's the energy you use divided by the time you use it. Um, the longer the time you use, the lower your wattage. And there's 7.8 and 7.9 are just uh, other examples. Okay, talk to you guys later. Bye.